and we're live. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hey, Josh. Hey, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good evening. Uh, and welcome to the Dark Ozarks. <clears throat> Just a couple of days after Lanasa. Um, we are well into now the, uh, the, the midsummer season, later than midsummer season, hurtling toward uh, really the Halloween season. And I've got a, got a fun episode to dig into tonight. Yes, haunted houses. Uh, quintessential, uh, easily stereotyped, interesting motifs, lots of cliches associated therewith. Yes. <laughs> uh, before we before we dig in uh, too deeply on that, we do have a great lineup of October events. Certainly, a, a question that uh, that shows up not um, uh, not irregularly. A regular a regular question for us is: When are y'all having live events? We have a slate of live events uh, coming up beginning on September 17th. Yes, Soda Fest. Yes, State of the Ozarks Fest in downtown Hollister will be from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, on, uh, on Saturday, September 17th, really the kickoff of, uh, of our list of events. And <clears throat> be a great opportunity. Of course, it's, I, I would hazard to say it's certainly one of the most unique, if not the most unique street festivals in the Ozarks for a mm -hmm. variety of reasons. And, I agree. Uh, the, uh, the Dark Ozarks booth will be down there. Uh, we'll have books. You'll be down there. I'll be around. And uh, be a great opportunity to shake it howdy and ask questions. Yes. And just enjoy a lot of entertainment, live entertainment, <laughs> everything from music to medieval combat <laughs> absolutely no uh, no festival is complete without a sword fight yes and food uh arts crafts all kinds of things mm -hmm. lots and lots of fun mm. and then following that up one week later on the 24th yes. um we will be in Caney, Kansas, uh, presenting at the Border uh, border Town Paracon. Yes, and we will. That will be a lot of fun. <clears throat> it will. Uh, <clears throat> this is a part of uh, sort of the borders, Ozark Borderlands region uh, that I'm excited to get to, have not been to before. And of course, incredibly honored to be asked to be a speaker. Uh, also excited, they, they, um, they picked one one of my more uh, mysterious uh, profile photos. I'm looking very very serious in uh, in that profile photo, and I, I need to thank uh, Jessica and the, the folks involved for uh, for doing that. <laughs> yes, it was a good selection. It was. I appreciate it. I'm going. <clears throat> uh, I look really good in that one. Also. Uh, I look more serious than I usually do in real life. That's fair. That that's true. I I can vouch for that. But, um, but you, know, <clears throat> you look like you know more what you're saying. I don't know. You know, but <clears throat> when uh, when the the, the paracon rolls around in Canyon, Kansas, I will I will do my best to look very grim and serious, <laughs> but um, not too grim. <laughs> Unless I'm talking about the Grim, which would be a different subject altogether. So, uh, good times there. And then as we move into October, uh, the October 7th, first Friday Art Walk in, again, in Hollister, Missouri, in conjunction with the State of the Ozarks First Friday Art Walk, um, we will be doing a haunted walking and haunted and history walking tour. Yes, and this can be a lot of fun. And First of all, everyone, if you haven't been to downtown Hollister, it's beautiful. It's mm -hmm. uh, basically uh, built as a, you know, an old English Tudor village, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And the host <laughs> will be in period clothing. Yes. Yes, and we will. To, to, to be as well, or cosplay or whatever you want. Absolutely. I might, I might throw on a pair of antlers. One never knows with me. Uh, belying that really serious profile photo. 
uh, I'm <laughs> quite happy with. And, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, October 15th, uh, October Country, hosted by Dark Ozarks with Always Buy Books. Yes, and that's going to be held in Joplin, Missouri at the VFW Post 534, just off of uh, Main Street in Joplin. All day event. We will be covering a number of topics that come under the umbrella of the Dark Ozarks. And there's going to be other activities, refreshments, etc. So come on out and uh, have a good time. And the uh, tickets for that event and the other October events after this one are all available on paranormalsciencelab.com. So Fantastic. then <laughs> just a, a few days later on the following Thursday, we yes. will be in Joplin um, doing the old Joplin downtown walking tour, which covers history and ghost tales uh, of the downtown area. Uh, in conjunction with Third Thursday uh, Art Walk uh, in Joplin. Uh, we are co-sponsoring that with the Downtown Joplin Alliance that does a lot of good work, uh, community projects, um, everything from Art Walks to the Empire Farmers uh, Market to uh, a large hand in the renovation of the Olivia and other matters. So, um, yes. And the event that uh, help the alliance, right. and then after that, we will <laughs> on the 29th of October, we will be in Newtonia. Yes, we will uh, back at the Ritchie Mansion, and uh, this is uh, a mirror event that uh, uh, to the one that we did in April. And, uh, again, incredible. One of my favorite events of 2020, of 2022, I have no idea what year it is, uh, of this year. And uh, <clears throat> fantastic opportunity, um, beautiful and beautifully restored and maintained antebellum home in Newtonia. One of those places that if you're driving by, I swear, if you notice it, you'd be like, oh my gosh, I wish I could go in there. Well, this night you can. Yes, and 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 it it is a place that is not, just open to the public nine to five Monday to Friday or anything so it's a good opportunity and to hear a lot of history ghost tales etc plus we will also be touring the Civil War Cemetery mm -hmm. which is also one of my favorite places one of mine too and this is a, this is a cemetery oftentimes folks associate cemeteries with hauntings um erroneously simply because people are buried there so on and so forth oh my goodness it must be haunted oftentimes that's not the case yeah. this cemetery uh, is haunted it is and and it, it has a very unique atmosphere too not even even among hauntings um mm -hmm. yes it does the yes the cemetery it does. itself is very liminal and uh and presence is very very uh, um obvious when you're there it is <clears throat> it is um sometimes uh can be quite welcoming but very much there yes so yeah. full full yeah. calendar <laughs> and uh, we we do <laughs> invite folks to uh to get tickets to plan for these events get them on get get them on your calendar we'd love to get to shake and have and visit with you at any of them and of course we would be amiss if we did not include a conversation about a wonderful sponsor always buying books in joplin missouri very, very true um they sponsor the uh, the podcast as well as sponsoring uh october country and you know it's it's a good fit because of course we do a lot of research and they really regionally are have a unique collection of not only fiction but nonfiction and research material um, that is not commonly found uh, and there's something for everybody really in all price ranges. They, there is and. And of course, if you want to follow along in Dark Ozark's footsteps and and uh, and do research as well, well, Always Buying Books is one of our top resources. It really is. Uh, 
we uh, we use it to use resources all the time. Here's what I've been reading lately. <laughs> so exactly. uh, for both <clears throat> uh, for both research and for pleasure reading, uh, fantastic selection of titles for for pleasure reading. And you don't have to, even if you if you're somewhere you can't get there in person to uh, peruse the shelves, uh, you can find them online at alwaysbuyingbooks.com. You can find them on Facebook, Always Buying Books um, in Joplin, Missouri. There's an associated group, friends who like Always Buying Books. And often some of the unique inventory is listed on Facebook yeah. and you can you can purchase it. Or just call them up and see if they have what you're looking for. And they will mail it out. You know, you can live, you know, California, Maine, Florida, wherever, and you, you can uh, take advantage of that. One hundred percent. So we do encourage you to to check uh, out Always Buying Books. Bob and Elise do an amazing job, and uh, we're excited to work with them. Yes, we are. And now we get, now we have a really fun topic. Yes, we do. Haunted houses. <laughs> the haunted house it's just it's a character of its own it really is <clears throat> it really is and there, there's so many different aspects to it i do find it interesting when you when you bring up the concept of a haunted house it oftentimes without really meaning to you start almost thinking of the house as the ghost well that's true and and I think in some cases that is kind of appropriate um, mm -hmm. because it, it seems like the, the house almost is um, the personality of the house itself is part of the activity in some places. Yes. Um, but we end up, people end up with a lot of assumptions too. First of all, yeah. their, their idea of what, what does a haunted house look like? Well, it's, it's very easy. Um, it's a three-story dilapidated Victorian, uh, high on a hill, uh, or at the end of a long, long drive. Uh, it's been vacant for many, many years. There's lots of stories about it. And if it doesn't look like that, it's not haunted. That, I mean, that, that certainly is the the idea that, that we, we often get, particularly from, you know, TV and movies, et cetera. And, and it's gotta be a Victorian too, you know, Iron Gate and everything too, you know, so. Um, and I guess that's one thing that often, people often will assume that, well, if it's a new house, it can't be haunted as a consequence. Yes, there's that, that, uh, that knee-jerk assumption or even unconscious assumption in in that regard and uh, that's not the case no <clears throat> sometimes much to a new or young homeowner's chagrin that's true some of the some of the most interesting activity i've encountered investigating ashley was in you know, new construction or very very relatively new uh, construction <clears throat> so. and now i i will say just as a as a continuation My little Ozark howler does not get to have zucchini banana, a zucchini chocolate zucchini, but um, now as a now calm down, baby. Um, as uh, just a, a continuation of the something that we've already mentioned, <clears throat> there are. Certainly in, in fiction and in real life, there are some things, um, well, physical things, that really seem to take on a character of their own. They become a character within the space. Um, certainly uh, certain historic and iconic towns and cities, uh, the location itself is a character. Yes, places like Salem, Massachusetts, or I saw St. Augustine, Florida's one, Savannah, yes, etc. And and sometimes just <clears throat> certain landscapes, 
uh, really become a character. Of course, uh, certain iconic um, objects, uh, the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars, the, the Starship Enterprise from, the, from, uh, from Star Trek, uh, General, yes. Lee, General Lee from Dukes of Hazard, the Impala from Supernatural. Uh, these are these are these are objects that really have their own personality. It's almost as though they have their own. Um, they are a living character. That, I mean, that's true because of well, mainly the associations that end up coming with them uh, that are unspoken, and and I think in a lot of regards, it's why in America we tend to default to a haunted house is a victorian um and maybe that's why we just sort of blindly say oh it's new it's not haunted um mm -hmm. <clears throat> and i think in part because we assume being old makes it more likely to be haunted but also just the architecture itself more of that ornate gothic look that we we don't get too much of anymore so it's exotic in, in some ways mm -hmm. and i think a lot of the stories i think you we were talking earlier you were talking about um that because of some events in that time period um that they ended up being associated as being haunted you might go into that a little bit <clears throat> yes um during in in North America, certainly in the United States, specifically uh, during the Victorian era, uh, there were a couple of pretty severe recessions, panics and recessions, economic recessions that caused a lot of at the time new home construction to be abandoned. Of course, the the construction at the time was Victorian homes, and the ones most prone to being abandoned were the ones that were most expensive to upkeep. Uh, which leads to these large, um, beautiful Victorian mansions uh, scattered across the United States, uh, particularly in the eastern part of the United States, which, interestingly enough, was also, you know, going to be the area that would have the most literary and media traditions uh, being perpetuated. And <clears throat> then they become uh, abandoned, then they become dilapidated, then uh, perhaps a generation or two, folks don't necessarily remember why, but there's a creepy house at the, the top of a hill or, you know, and I, and I think particularly these, these uh, more grand homes would have been located or were located uh, in, <clears throat> in notable areas, the, uh, you know, the top of a hill, the, the beautiful view overlooking, overlooking the river, the situation where the uh, quote unquote, you know, lower classes would look up at the house uh, and tell stories about it. Exactly. And so over time, that became <coughs> sort of the unspoken assumption that that's where you go find ghosts. Uh, yes. Find them. And yeah. uh, it certainly has, has created imagery that uh, media still uses today in, in movies and TV shows, et cetera. Um, 100%. I mean, unspoken, you know, characters can walk into a place like that and you know, the audience is already expecting that there's going to be something paranormal related. Yes, it is something that I, I find uh, sort of refreshing actually uh, about Poltergeist, now classic from the yeah. 80s. <clears throat> is that the the haunting is in a modern suburban home in a modern suburban neighborhood of course that plays into the story if you've not seen the film right but, but it also but but i think a key point on that is that it really it builds tension because it's not supposed to be yes exactly and <clears throat> Uh, I, I personally blame the, uh, the book covers, the Nancy Drew book covers, and also Scooby Doo, for, uh, for perpetuating the perhaps unfair motif uh, in regards to abandoned Victorian homes. However, <clears throat> however, uh, there are a lot of old homes that are indeed quite haunted 
including but not limited to the Victorian era. That's true. I mean that 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 is true, and and I do think that a place that has had more contact with people over time tends to have a greater chance of being haunted. Yes, yes, it does, and there's there's just there's there's a lot of places to dig in on this. It is iconic. Um, certainly, of course, selling a haunted house does not have quite the same financial ring to it as marketing your own haunted hotel. Well, I mean, that's true. However, um, in recent years, there it has become more of a market for that people wanting to buy a haunted house. <clears throat> Um, which, you know, it, it's, it's funny to me, I, these things, I think, kind of do go in cycles because I don't think people thought much about it one way or another uh, uh, as far as actually buying one until probably, probably Am Amityville Horror uh, mm -hmm. became famous with the book and the movie. Yes. Um, and then suddenly, you know, people, I don't want to buy a haunted house. Uh, <clears throat> And then, uh, then it became really taboo to, you know, to talk about, well, if there's anything that would make anyone think it's haunted, you don't want to mention that. Um, right. And then with the rise with the reality ghost shows, et cetera, now there's becoming a market for people wanting to buy a haunted house. Demons cost extra. That's true. Yeah. It's more maintenance, you know. It is. They keep banging things around. Yeah, more more upkeep, <laughs> scratching the finish. Yeah. Um, usually, usually, uh, usually three three scratches at a time, and it's a pain. Yeah. <laughs> Another cliche. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <clears throat> so in this. Um, I, I definitely want to, in our, in our discussion tonight, I want to deal with uh, or, or sort of survey uh, a number of haunted houses we've, we've uh, had direct association with or, you know, connection with family, et cetera. <clears throat> Something I find is perhaps a, just a, a, an overview you know, high, high, high view perspective or observation, just in paranormal in general, particularly in terms of my house is haunted, um, et cetera, is <clears throat> the fact that I, I really feel like we've, we have a lot of sensationalism associated with the paranormal. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have, <clears throat> and certainly we, we have our fair share of <clears throat> stayed um, critics of paranormal. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of discussion in regards to <clears throat> debunking where necessary, but being more than willing to look at a situation and say, yes, there is activity there. This is a real thing. Uh, perhaps not a, not some, not a, in most cases, not a reason for you to run screaming out of the building. Uh, but is there is there activity there? Uh, are there are there energies there or entities uh, that are associated with the structure? Yes, in many cases, the answer is yes. Yes, yes, and 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 I think that is important to say that in, in virtually all, I would say, you know, that it wouldn't cause me. To, to leave um, or necessarily to avoid even buying a house. Um, you know, there have been occasions that uh, I elected not to, but. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but not because I was running scared, but. Right, <clears throat> right. And uh, <clears throat> in our, uh, respective homes. Uh, we have we have both had activity. Yes. 
yours yours is is a lot more stable activity than mine is was yeah well and but again it kind of goes back to um my house is a lot older it is yes. victorian um uh, ironically um and yours is a lot newer and there wasn't prior construction on it yes <laughs> yes um from, from really what i can tell the my my primary incident was with an attached object uh, an object that that and i think that i think that's very fair to say too that um there aren't a lot of cases that activity yeah. does seem to attach um or be sur you know surround an object for whatever reason and yeah. that can affect those you know victorian old houses as well because um yeah you know, usually an, those kind of items are either something that is very, very connected to a particular person, had a lot of meaning um, for them, or was somehow associated with some sort of tragic event. Um, right. <clears throat> and you're just more likely to have that in a house that's been around a long time with a lot of people. You are. <clears throat> you are. And uh, for folks who are wondering, it was a uh... Uh, an old print, an old turn of the century print that I purchased. I uh, mm -hmm. felt very compelled to purchase it. And it did seem, I, I, I feel very strongly uh, that there was uh, someone who was attached to it. And, and I, I, I did not get the, uh, the impression that the attachment was associated necessarily with tragedy, but simply that there was a lot of emotion, a lot of heart, um, Someone, someone cared about this piece for very strong emotional reasons. And I think that's, I think that's a good point. Is that hauntings aren't all about tragedy? No, um, <clears throat> no. You know, it, it can be an item that was just was very well loved, um, um, and uh, it, it's more the amount of energy involved rather than the kind. Yes, <clears throat> and you know, once once you move onto the this plane of you know conceptualizing about this particular plane, <clears throat> things don't necessarily follow in a linear manner, and so yeah. hauntings can come and go. Uh, they can simmer down. They can they can reappear. Mm -hmm. uh, they can they can sneak up behind you and chew on your ear. Um, <laughs> so. It's our very own Ozark Howler. Yes. Um, for, for folks in the video podcast, you get to see our Ozark Howler. It's a little agitated, but also very full. So yeah. Sleep is, sleep is warring against the desire to chew on everything. Is that, you know, it happens to all of us. It does. It really does. <laughs> It certainly does. And he is a sweetheart of a, of a little baby. Uh, celebrating uh, <clears throat> celebrating 14 weeks. Uh, he is an American Basset puppy. And he's my American Basset puppy. And if you, uh, if you follow along uh, on, uh, on my Facebook, uh, you'll get way too many photos of, uh, of baby Sky right at the moment. That's okay. It's uh, <clears throat> and so, and that's of course for folks who are, if you're following along in the video cast, you get to see him. If you don't, go over to Facebook, look me up. Uh, this guy is all over the place right at the moment because he is way too doggone cute. He's we're also he is also a paranormal investigative dog in training. Yes, and and I and that's that's a good point <clears throat> that. Um, Pets and animals often are uh, as much involved in hauntings as as the people in the house. Yes, in some cases, a haunting may be an animal. That's true. That does happen. Um, uh, certainly, have had situations like that uh, come up, and mm -hmm. um, including some that were pretty um, specific and and detailed. Um, Yes. And including maybe even following an, 
an owner from one house to another. So, um, yes. And in that sense, that that's that animal spirit is pretty much attached to the owner. So, um, you just never know. You really don't. It's, <clears throat> and I, 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 I find I find the idea of animal spirits to be very comforting, actually, in in most cases. And, I, I do too, you know, um, now if it were an apex predator, it might be a little different. Yeah, yeah, Southeast Asian tiger that comes back as a ghost could be a little problematic. Yeah, you know, polar bear, <laughs> et cetera, you know, yeah. <laughs> now, now there's, there's a question, are the Inuit uh, haunted by polar bears? That would be a little frightening. That, uh, this is, uh, <laughs> Arctic Base One <laughs> reports an incident. <laughs> it's a little difficult to explain right now. Just please send help. Help. <laughs> lots and lots of help. Uh, but I, you know, we we've <clears throat> jumping subjects, but I'm I'll just on the overall subject of paranormal. Um, ghost or phantom horses is not an uncommon report no it, no it's not and i well and it may surprise a lot of people but of course horses were very um involved you know very close um in so many activities and in people's lives for so long um although now you know we think of basically cars in the same way um but yeah i've had multiple investigations where there were phantom horses or sounds and, and we and we investigated one in particular that uh, had some pretty vivid phantom horse activity yes yes very much so so <clears throat> going back to the, the the haunted house motif. Of course, we've talked about the I, the concept of it. We've talked about some of the the misconceptions associated thereof. You know, one thing one thing that we we haven't mentioned is the haunted house as the haunting itself, where the house itself is the haunting. Is the uh, haunting? Yes. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> this is a an not uncommon in Ozark's folklore, the disappearing, the phantom cabin. Yes. Um, tales came out of the early settlers, early travelers going through the region when, and in setting the stage, generally very few roads, um, parts of the region, you pretty much had to navigate by, by water, whether it was steamboat or canoe <laughs> etc yeah. yeah. um, and roads were basically just trails and they would come across uh, a cabin see a cabin up ahead usually maybe uh, light coming from a window smoke coming from the chimney and then as they get to it it's empty, no one's there, often appears that no one's been there in a long time. Maybe they spend the night, maybe they go on, and they meet someone on down the road and mention it, and then they're told there's, not only is there no house, no cabin there, but there never was. Mm -hmm. And it's, <clears throat> of course, we do have to frame this within the reality that much of this these are collected folk tales rather mm -hmm. than personal experiences. But even as a folk tale, this is an idea that, <clears throat> for whatever reason, largely was resonating with the society at the time, the audience. Yes. Um, and, you know, because some of these tales seem to even predate the Civil War. So, and part of me says, you know, it, it, it's something coming out of the war experience and all of the, the burnt homes and, and so forth. But it seems to go back further than that in the folk tales. So it seems to be more primal than that. And 
there are there are a few tales of of a disappearing cabin in the in Appalachia, but really, as far as I know, not really other places. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Something on a on a perhaps more historical but mundane aspect. <clears throat> Simply the devastation in the Ozarks from the guerrilla warfare may have contributed to this idea no yeah i agree i think it i think it did but there seems to be some of the tales that came out along this uh motif before the war but i third i certainly think the civil war sort of uh made it more common and, and probably uh imprinted in memory more um and there certainly could have been cases where people were mistaken that there had been a cabin there and they got burned in the war. Um, I know of a particular incident, well, it's the Raider farm where um, there was a massacre during the massacre during the war, it's burned down. Uh, locals refused to build there for a number of years, several decades. Then a new family comes in, uh, builds right on the foundation of the old house. Um, they're not afraid of the stories because the story's gone around, it's haunted, etc. Um, and they seem to live there very well for 20, 30 years. And then there's another fire um, mm -hmm. in first stamp. And then it stands empty actually to this day, you know, yeah. uh, which would have been probably more than a hundred years after the second house burned down. Yes. Um, and so um, I can see over time where people might get confused as was there a cabin there or not even. So maybe there had been one that ended up being yes. burned whatever. And it, you know, you, you think about, oh, just the, the uh, rather dramatic changes that can take place in modernization the fact that uh, you know the, the disconcerting quality, say I'm I'm speaking purely hypothetical at this point, but say, <clears throat> for example, uh, antebellum, you know, pre-war families in the Burnt District that <clears throat> go, you know, go for example, escape to Texas mm -hmm. uh, in the 1860s, <clears throat> and then perhaps for some reason come back 20 years later and and see the fact that their their homeland so to speak looks nothing like what they had 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 grown up with that's true i mean and and i think there probably were those kind of examples um and then there's you know some of them that come out of travel you know just traveling salesmen etc you know telling these stories um yes. and people probably don't realize how many people really did travel so much selling whatever during mm -hmm. that time period. It was yeah. very common for uh, traveling salesmen to, to wander through and stop at various places. So yeah. um, I, you know, even one or two of these stories getting started, they could get spread around <laughs> probably pretty quickly. <laughs> really quickly. <clears throat> and uh, was Vance uh, reference Vance Randolph, but some of his more memorable stories in probably his most memorable book, uh, which I'm not sure if I can say the title of on regular podcast, um, is <clears throat> many of his stories were collected from from traveling salesmen in the Ozarks. Yes, that's true. That, that's true because they they talked to so many people and heard a lot. <clears throat> And, and it, it was mm, <clears throat> exact, you know, perhaps perpetuating a, a specific claim, but the idea that your, your regular everyday um, farmers would not necessarily have been exposed to the more cosmopolitan uh, dirty jokes. True. That, uh, or, or if they were, <clears throat> um, 
there was there was more of a um, social restriction on sharing, where because they had to live with everyone, whereas their 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 your traveling salesman, your uh, your truck driver, your you know they they could be in town for the night and never see any of these people again or not see them for another month, that sort of thing. That's true. I, and, I, and I think that that is worth noting as to how some of these stories get spread around. So <clears throat> that is a good point. Um, so digging, what, digging. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, what, what are your thoughts on sort of the sort of the assumptions people have about um, just the items that tend to be associated with hauntings, you know, mirrors and, and, you know, weapons and things like that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> mirrors, clocks, <clears throat> watches, uh, dresses, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, wedding dresses. I find it <clears throat> interesting that, uh, you know, the women's clothing in the form of wedding, of a wedding dress certainly is, has a lot more of a, a motif uh, associated with it than say like a man's suit um, yes and, however uh, now the flip side you you often have apparitions with top hats in particular this is true <clears throat> this is true uh, <clears throat> and interestingly enough uh tobacco use smoking the smell mm -hmm. of cherry tobacco the smell of a particular cologne, men's cologne, uh, these types of things, the smell of old fashioned cigarettes uh, are, are often associated with many types of hauntings, certainly not excluding uh, hauntings of homes. <clears throat> and then uh, children's clothing, particularly, you know, uh, baby dresses, yeah. uh, those, those types of things. And that <clears throat> certainly from a, from a, uh, an emotional standpoint, especially when you when you're really looking at the <clears throat> oh <clears throat> infant mortality rate prior to about 1950. Yeah, and, and particularly in the 1800s with all the various epidemics. I think too, um, and people don't think about it so much now, but. Um, there would be mementos uh, kept of the person, uh, lots of hair, things like that, uh, for mourning jewelry, etc. That and um, I've seen uh, Victorian homes that you know had almost a collection of various lots of hair of different family members that have passed. Um, much to the much. Much to the uh, much to the horror of anyone who uh, practices hoodoo and who might want to protect that family. That that's true, and that was just what I'm saying is that, and if you look at it from a from a perspective of hoodoo or voodoo, those items are very powerful. Yes, yes, and and would make the uh, the owner, <clears throat> the 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 person associated with it, incredibly vulnerable. Mm hmm. Uh, to hexing uh, or to conjure which uh, is that um, or um, the flip side is if they're a practitioner make them give them a lot of protection if used correctly <clears throat> yes what do you <clears throat> because I, I think that it I think it could be fair to say that it's not a it's not a bad thing so certain Victorian funerary customs mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> are, are, are things that I, I can really, or certainly 19th century uh, funerary customs are things that I can really appreciate. The, the immediacy of the loss, the importance of processing grief mm -hmm. uh, in an in a, in a, in immediate and non-distant way. Um, yeah the idea that that everything comes to a halt uh the yes. the mirrors are covered the clocks are stopped uh anyone associated with a family member if at all possible 
you know, minus a terrible freeze, uh, that, that everything simply stops in order for essentially this person's life to be honored. Yes. And, <clears throat> and, and I think one thing is that people don't realize now that we, you know, when we grieve now, and, and certainly grief is, it can be deep, we aren't, we still aren't near as close to that grieving process as they were in that time period, because um, most, most deaths happen in a hospital uh, or um, a residential care center. Um, and they, the bodies, the, the loved one is not cared for after death at, in the home and funerals not in the living room. Um, and so all of these things meant it, it was very much a part of what the people were experiencing and the location as well. Yes. <clears throat> and the, the fact that, and of course, coming back to the haunted home, haunted house, and the idea that, uh, you know, a, a family would have, <clears throat> would have seen their loved one mm -hmm. die in the home. They, they would have seen their, the, the wake, essentially the, the entire experience uh, <clears throat> would have been carried on <clears throat> in the home. And in some cases, the, uh, the, the family cemetery could be just outside the house. That's true, because often family cemeteries were on site and sometimes uh, literally just a few feet from the door. Yeah. The Ritchie Mansion is a good example of that. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and that, you know, the hauntings associated there with. That's true. So um, it, it, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And uh, <laughs> we have a wild boy. <laughs> the, the, uh, um, <clears throat> it really does make a lot of sense. So now just to finish my, my thought, there's, there's a number of those, um, the immediacy of the funereal customs of the 19th century, I'll just say broadly the 19th century, that uh, I really, I look to with a lot of respect. Um, and uh, the association, for example, of seeing cemeteries as more as I actually see cemeteries, which are, are beautiful parks, that uh, beautiful public spaces to, to honor those who've gone on before and to just uh, experience on a regular basis. You know, I don't go to a, uh, your, your typical cemetery. Uh, I don't go there. Uh, Natchez Cemetery comes to mind. It's glorious. Uh, I'm not wandering around Natchez going, oh my goodness, I'm going to see a ghost. This is so incredibly creepy. Ooh. I'm going there and I, I've been twice. Uh, anytime, you know, if I'm in Natchez, I am going to go to the cemetery yeah. because it is just so incredibly beautiful. And I love that. Well, and, and I feel that way about a number of cemeteries that, uh, <clears throat> and, and people don't realize too that it was very common. People would go to cemeteries to have picnics and- Yes. And, Cemeteries were very much viewed as much for the living as for the departed. Yes. Now, all of that to be said, there are a handful of certainly Victorian specific funerary customs that here. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, mm, the artwork made out of the dead's hair, as we've already mentioned. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not big on bringing that one back. <laughs> and i won't tell you where you've been that they have it so <laughs> I, I find it fascinating i really do um <clears throat> but there, there's you know certainly the the modern sensibility is to recoil with that but mm -hmm. as we've already mentioned the the hoodoo sensibility says oh well you did that didn't you <laughs> yeah very much so. But, you know, I think it really came out of the fact that so, I mean, 
so few people had photos. Um, yes. And really, before the, before the Civil War, very few photos were were done, um, and photography only, you know, basically became available in the 1830s. So um, people often they would have a memento to really remind them of that person because they didn't, you know, unless you were wealthy enough to have portraits painted, uh, you didn't have that. So, uh, you know, lock a hair in a, in a, a locket or something would remind them of that person as a person too. Yes. And I think that's very fair. That, uh, another, another artifact that certainly has a lot of motifs, certainly in pop culture, uh, but in a lot of uh, ethno-historic, uh, historical aspects are, are dolls. Yes, that, that's true. Um, dolls, um, and I think too, dolls became much more commonplace in the 1800s. <laughs> yes. Uh, or, Prior to that time, most children that had dolls, they were homemade, they were very simple, really didn't have, you know, most didn't have features. And so um, for the first time, you were getting dolls that were really resembled a person. Yes. And, you know, they very, you know, quickly became associated as being vessels for a spirit. Yes, and there is a lot of motif for that. I mean, a lot of history, uh, lore associated with that. <clears throat> I all around the world too, not just yes. not just in America or Europe. So no, and I find I find this really interesting. I <clears throat> I missed out on the oh my gosh, dolls are creepy phenomena. My uh, my my mom, my my sisters all had that all had dolls. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> my sister collected dolls, collects dolls. And uh, I, I grew up just with the idea of, oh, they're, it's just, it's just part of the, this, the landscape really. And, you know, and then, <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> um, you know, within the last you know, 15 years, started running across people who would recoil with horror at a, a porcelain doll and i was initially quite confused by that like, okay. well to be honest, me too um because and, and we i mean i had i had some dolls growing up i mean we there wasn't really a collection or anything but i just never really viewed them as as creepy and it was never you know no one in my family viewed it that way it was just oh it's it's a doll whatever right. yeah you know. um, <laughs> And so I always thought that was a little odd, although over time I have run into, you know, a couple that I can say, okay, that is a little creepy looking, but. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I, I know, I know at least one person, probably more than one person, uh, that if they have to sleep in a room with dolls, they turn all of their face, all of them away so that they can't look at them while they sleep. I've, I've heard of people doing that before. Um, I, now I can say, you know, uh, had an investigation, uh, well, a series of investigations at house uh, some years ago that the owner, the owner owned it, and then her parents had, had it before, and her parents were prolific uh, antique collectors, mm-hmm. and they had a collection mm-hmm. of hundreds of doll porcelain dolls, and a lot of them were just just the heads. So yes. you would walk, you know, walk down, and, and it was a large Victorian mansion. Imagine that. And so you, there would be cabinet after cabinet filled with these dolls. And I, I do recall, uh, I think the first time we were there, set, you know, we were setting up equipment, and one of the one of the investigators went around a, a corner, and you there were just like a whole wall of cabinets with nothing but doll heads. And we hear this this, ah, reaction. (laughs) 
I don't think it was so much that they, you know, were afraid of dolls, but it was just just the sheer number of porcelain dolls was a little unsettling. <laughs> just a, just a bit much, and and I think that's very fair. That reminds me, and then I, I want to I want to get into a specific discussion of some of our specific haunted house experiences, but uh, okay. uh, an iconic image from 1986, 1987. Um, National Geographic, the, the first uh, issue on <clears throat> having discovered the Titanic. And oh, yeah. there is, in that edition, there, there is an image <clears throat> that was taken oh, of the seafloor of a porcelain doll head staring mm -hmm. back out of the murk. Yeah. And it is tragic it is and i think for me i think it's because to me it's an association with a child yes <clears throat> and knowing <clears throat> knowing that this was a child who in all likelihood drowned yeah and uh and and her doll sank thousands of feet below the the the, the atlantic uh, and and lay in complete darkness uh, until uh, that that first submersible made it right made up. it to the to the wreck site, and <clears throat> it's a, it's a contemplation of mortality. It is a uh, an introspective contemplation of a life cut short. It's it's very sad, as well as being visually uh, arresting yes in its in its appearance <clears throat> I, I, I oh go ahead no go ahead no no i was i was just i, I was just thinking of something but go, go ahead finish your thought uh, i was i was just going to say <clears throat> for the record i do not have a lot of dolls in my house in case anybody wondered uh, <laughs> no you don't <laughs> actually i don't in mine either <laughs> there are a couple but <laughs> for my childhood and that's it <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> now I, I will say that talking about specific uh, haunted houses, did investigate one that did have it's the one time that there was a doll involved that something happened that I to this day I can't explain. Um, and I think I, I probably told you this story the doll head on the mantle. Yes. Um, and <laughs> again this is a this literally was the house from the 1800s built on the hill um had sat empty for probably 20 years um all of the original family's stuff was still in it by the way um, mm -hmm. uh, scattered about etc so it really <laughs> did have that feel and it's the middle of winter it's about 20 degrees um i don't know what it is about ghost hunt investigators we end up either investigating when it's 110 or 20. Yep. Um, there's no electricity on the house there's no heat nothing and in the formal living room there's a very ornate mantle and there is a porcelain doll head sitting on the mantle at some point someone you know goes over to it and i don't really put their hand out and they say they can feel hot air coming, rising above it. Mm -hmm. And so two or three people have that experience. I go over, I don't feel anything. And one of the person who was also a sensitive, he could not feel anything. Everyone else did. And Brian and I were like, you people are nuts because we don't feel, I mean, just didn't feel anything. But they could hold their hand over the doll's head and put it on our cheek and it was hot. Their hand was hot. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I still, I have no explanation for that. <laughs> yes. And I, and I think that's, that's also a perfect example that in paranormal investigation, things will occur or with someone, not necessarily someone doing an investigation, but just experiencing paranormal incidences that according to our <clears throat> logic these things don't make sense no that's true and 
And I think I think part of the problem is people get really wrapped up into that it has to make sense. There has to be an explanation. Yes. And sometimes yes. you just have to say, okay, that's weird. I don't know why. Right. I don't know why are you doing mm -hmm. that? Why did, why does one person experience something the person standing next to them does not? Those exactly. types of things. And those, exactly. those are, that's part part of it. Uh, as we were talking, I, I made uh, just a short list of, of haunted houses okay. uh, for us to do a, perhaps a short survey. <clears throat> um, the, uh, <clears throat> of course, the antebellum homes that we're most very familiar with, the Kendrick House and the Ritchie Mansion. Mm -hmm. um, the Ball House, which we were, were, yes. were at recently. Um, the, the Union Screaming House, referencing... Yes. Uh, Stephen's work and personal experience and also um, you'll get the you'll get the titles right whereas I won't necessarily but a plug for his book and oh yeah the uninvited yes uh, by Stephen Lachance and yes. <laughs> and um, and then also uh, a house I'd love to do an investigation in in Ozark and then right next door for the Weaver house also yeah. in Ozark, Missouri. I should be. I should clarify. And for people outside of the Ozarks, guess what? We have the Ozarks Mountain region, and then in Missouri we have the city of Ozark, and then in Arkansas we also have the city of Ozark. Yes. So <laughs> you have to clarify. <laughs> yes. And uh, and and most of these uh, are not malevolent hauntings. Of course, Stephen's experiences, which he's documented. Mm -hmm. uh, in Union, Missouri, which is in the Ozarks, but near the St. Louis Metro, was quite malevolent. Yes, it was. That, that's, that is sort of that, you know, that 1%. <laughs> that, it, not it like is. everything else. No, and, and it's, and I think that, I mean, realistically, of all the places that we've gone to and talked to people about, et cetera, those are, those are kind of the odds that, mm -hmm. you know, you and I know of one, and then we've been in numerous other locations that the hauntings are are often quite benign. Kendrick House in particular comes to mind in the sense that if the folks at the Kendrick House like you, you're you're golden. Yeah. But on the other hand, if if they don't, you may think it's, you know, a malevolent haunting, but it really isn't. Um, right. They're just being protective. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Coleman Theater, you know, um, can be viewed that way too. Um, Very much so. <laughs> you know, um, again, it's whether they like you or not, or a particular experience. And um, I mean, I know someone who had a very bad experience um, in, in, the, in the basement. Yes. And, and um, actually, the last time I, we mentioned uh, the, the Coleman, he, he messaged me about that. <laughs> Absolutely, and and just like you, you were mentioning <clears throat> with uh, the doll head, um, one person can be impacted in a unique way. Uh, everyone else in the group might not notice anything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it it can be hmm, disconcerting for the person. Who has the awareness? It can be. Um, for those that ha have a sensitivity, either it's very unsettling and they don't want it, or they, or you tend to get to the point where you just accept it as another aspect of reality and sensory perception. Yes. <clears throat> um, Kendrick House really stands out to me. <clears throat> Uh, particularly when I've had the, you know, when we've had the opportunity to be there, when Dale can also be there, because as you and I've noticed, as Dale's noticed, uh, there's something about him that the the folks at Kendrick House, and for people who haven't caught on, when I say the folks at the Kendrick House, I'm talking about the ghosts. Yes. And when the when the folks at the Kendrick House uh, see Dale, or or sense Dale. It is, as you've noted, <clears throat> the, the likelihood seems to be 
that he reminds them of someone they know. That's that's my impression that that it must remind them of someone that they knew in life, you know, someone in the family or something. And uh, years ago, we had an investigator that seemed to have the same kind of experience. Um, he's the one that the, kept having the experience of a child crawling up on his lap and then mm. uh, wrapping their arms around his neck uh, repeatedly. And that was my conclusion is he must have reminded them that yeah. spirit of someone they knew. Yes. <clears throat> and once you, you, once you step into that space or begin to experience the paranormal in that space, the, the creepy side of it really just goes away in that in those instances it does i mean you know i mean there are things that that can happen you know shadow people etc that can you know can certainly freak people out a little bit but for the most part you know if you have that kind of experience you said it's because usually you know they're being rude or um being a jerk and getting a reaction and uh a couple of things just landing on Kendrick House. I've always felt very, very fortunate that uh, that the folks there mm, regard me benignly. Yeah, and that's that's you know that's my experience is that um, typically anyone that seems to have had an issue ten, tends to be a man that has a, a very um, arrogant or aggressive attitude. And brings um, that antagonistic energy into the space. Yes. And to be honest, I can only think of one, one woman that seemed to garner that kind of reaction. And um, in the context of things and her behavior, it, it's similar, but just not as exaggerated. Um, yeah. but otherwise <clears throat> never seen one you know have mm -hmm. that kind of issue yeah uh, dale dale has his own experience with kendrick in that regard uh, yeah this it's very interesting the the thing that was very striking to me uh for myself uh was i'm gonna throw <laughs> throw our throw our former intern uh into the into the mix uh noah the, uh -huh. when, when he when he was along um noah is of course he wouldn't mind i don't think he'd mind me saying this uh because i've told him um uh, <clears throat> is uh is not at all a, a mean individual but he does have a very antagonistic energy and he, he can rather intense <laughs> He's uh, <clears throat> uh, he's never met a met a, uh, a an argument that he doesn't want to back away from, and <laughs> and I and I appreciate that. But the the night that we were at Kendrick, um, and and a lot of the protective spirit element of the Kendrick house does seem to be associated with the stairway. Yes. And the first time up, we start going up. And by the time he gets up to the second floor, it starts at the landing. By the time he gets up to the second floor, he has an intense headache. Uh, he just spends a, maybe a minute upstairs, comes back down. When he walks out the front door, the headache's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, he does turn around and look, looks up. And as you're facing the Kendrick house on the right side, second floor window, he does see a figure in the window. It's, mm -hmm. um, and then, <clears throat> and then it was shortly after that. That's just when we were all kind of getting about, and then right. our, the tour, uh, the the history portion, and uh, you began, and we all began in the parlor, or mm -hmm. the well, the dining room, yeah, the dining room, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and Noah kind of looks at me, and he's like, "I really don't want to go back upstairs," and. I kind of, I'm, I'm thinking this through, we're sort of feeling this through. And I said, okay, here's what I want you to try. Put your hand on my, we're gonna go upstairs with the group. If, it, if anything gets weird, we'll just come back down. 
Mm -hmm. I said, put your hand on my shoulder and keep it there. Mm -hmm. And it was the best because I, I, it was, it was an idea. Right. Um, but it was the idea that the folks at the, at Kendrick, they're going to be reading energy more than necessarily specific conversations. Yeah. They, they understand, or I believe that they understood, and I believe that they do understand that I'm not there to, to pick a fight. Oh, no, I don't think they think, that, yeah, I agree that. And, and I want it was the only thing I could think of to communicate to them, basically, that if he keeps his hand on my shoulder, I'm showing, okay, he's with me. Right. And, and as I recall, he didn't have any other issue then. No, we walked upstairs, there's no headache. There was, there was no pushback. And <clears throat> I, I just found that really, really interesting. Of course, at the ball house, uh, some of the energy there pushed back pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, on Noah, mm -hmm. <clears throat> with uh, with uh, a lot of pressure in his head, uh, pain in his chest, and again the same thing. He walked outside, and it was gone. Yeah. And so. and and also that may be just him starting to recognize how he feels when he is in the presence of energy like that it it very it very well could be usually for me if it's uncomfortable it is just a sense of heaviness yeah but different people do experience different things so it, oh, it may be so. you know it, it may be him learning his sort of his body language in response to thing so it, it is uh, you know and it's and this is a process and i and I encourage people <clears throat> you know within a within a safe environment to you know really just become aware of what it is that you're feeling and compare notes with other folks understanding that not everybody's going to have the same sensations exactly and um you know an example that you know i give people is that if you're in these spaces more, you become more aware of how you feel when there's activity. Um, and, it, and a related experience for me is when there's high EMF, I've, I've done this long enough that I can walk in and I can recognize high EMF by the way it makes me feel before yeah. and then use meters to verify that. Yes. Yes. But before I investigated, I never would have even probably recognized a sensation. Right. Very, very true. Uh, are there other uh, specific haunted houses that come to mind for you that you'd like to talk about before we close? Hmm. That we both know? Hmm. Not necessarily. It could be stuff I haven't been to. Okay. Or I was, I was thinking, um, I didn't know if you want to talk about the Leaper house a little. Oh my gosh. I just love the, the, the creepy stories surrounding, well, just surrounding Colonel Leaper. Um, <laughs> and of course, this is, this is a really unique uh, part of the Ozarks, Wayne County, Missouri, um, uh, far eastern Ozarks. Uh, over really overlooking it's the, the last bit of plateau uh, before you drop down into the the Mississippi bottom land of the Mississippi Delta uh, associated with Cape Girardeau mm -hmm. lots of layers of history of course and then layers of weird things from uh, civil war ghosts to UFOs up at Piedmont to uh, just again layer and, and a lot of lore it's wild. It, chunks of this is very wild sparsely populated country uh there, there's a number of cryptid sightings in the region and some really amazing barbecue <laughs> that's fair <laughs> yeah <laughs> i just realized that my associate my my my, my phrasing, my choice of phrasing association just implied that the barbecue might be made out of cryptid, but 
it's good enough. I don't care. Uh, you can, you can, you can serve up smoked Bigfoot brisket. I don't care if it's that good. I'll eat it. Um, <laughs> no offense against the Bigfoots. I'm I'm not trying to eat the kin, but uh, <clears throat> Marble Hill does have a fantastic uh, barbecue restaurant. And a big shout out uh, to fellow researcher researcher Clint Lacey, uh, who was kind enough to take me there way back in March. Oh my goodness. That <clears throat> almost seems like a lifetime ago. This <laughs> we've crammed a lot in this this year. We have done a lot this year. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um Leaper is just such an, an interesting and in some cases frightening character. And of course, his mansion, uh, such as it is, is reported to be haunted by none other than Mr. Leeper. Mm -hmm. who, who was not a very nice man in life. No, no. Uh, a very complex, uh, complicated man. Um, certainly someone who mm, had uh, religious zeal um for his own aims yes i guess that that's a, a way to put it and didn't always have good consequences for the people around no no uh the the the, the man knew how to how to how to maintain a grudge if uh <laughs> if there was ever <laughs> ever ever an individual who could potentially become a malevolent spirit upon his death i think it's leaper and and i think that i think that gives rise to part of the mystique of his haunted house as well is agreed. the character of the man agreed and <clears throat> with the you know with that regardless of <clears throat> whether because okay for people who don't know um he committed serious atrocities during the civil war he mm -hmm. he rode out vendettas against entire families mm -hmm. um hunt, he, he hunted people in the in the name of right well yeah in the in the name of of, of the right of being morally right and in, in the name of war but he he really was literally not in the not fighting battles but literally hunting people <clears throat> yes and uh, and that's well documented i don't think that there's anyone who really looks into his his life yeah, and his, it's his, pretty clear and, and his and his written works his letters his diary those types of things that everything pretty much gels that this isn't this isn't and also compared outside of uh, regional his, history he's not terribly well known this isn't someone that history is necessarily thrown under the bus as a, right. as a scapegoat of the war um he seemed to be pretty clear about what he did and why he did it along with the sense that he really believed what he was doing was perfectly morally justified yeah and and that never seemed to really change either and and then after the war is a is a very successful businessman a mm -hmm. state representative um you know is is heavily involved in in the development of railroads the development of lumber and lumber industry pardon me after the war and and of course a certain amount of resentment building over the fact that the, this man who'd been hunting down quote unquote confederates in some cases yes they were confederates uh but certainly outside the the boundaries of of the 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 rules of war he was acting beyond his orders <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 something that <clears throat> sort of a you know larger picture scheme something that we seem to see over and over in the the trans mississippi theater are individuals who are out for themselves uh they they might be glory hounds they might be profit profit driven um they they really might might be exemplifying uh, essentially piracy on the high plains and the mountains and the war uh, suddenly gave them a, a license to move forward. And it mm -hmm. took a while. I, my hat's off to the federal government and the, the Union Army 
that in time, as reports started trickling back, that most of these individuals did get called out for it or, or demoted or, or sort of put out to pasture, so to speak, if they weren't right. killed by the opposition. But so it wasn't something that was necessarily being sanctioned by the U.S. Army, but yeah. it was something that was, seemed to be happening with considerable regularity in the Trans-Mississippi Theater. It, it, it was, it was, and, and I do think, I do think just the, for those who are aware of, of him as a, as a man, I, I think it lends credence to accept that, okay, that house is haunted. And then of course the, the tale of his death. Um, yes, and, and, the, and the, the weeks or months leading up to his death yeah and regardless of uh <clears throat> of, of how <clears throat> pardon me how one you know cuts the cake uh in terms of belief structure uh there there is there is something decidedly eerie about his last days that yeah. he he goes insane he has to be tied to his bed uh to prevent him from injuring himself he starts speaking of uh the dead um you know, congregating around him. He says he's seeing demons. He, he goes insane. Uh, and, and regardless, like I said, regardless of how you, how you cut that uh, metaphysically, theologically, uh, religiously, non-religiously, knowing his past, <clears throat> you, and, and knowing, knowing the types of, of, uh, atrocities that he seemed to enjoy committing, knowing the riches he was able to uh, amass mm -hmm. afterwards, you know, it, it brings to mind a real life uh, Faust. You're right. That is a good, a very good comparison. And, and in the, I think too, when you say, well, you know, he had these, he did these atrocities, etc. that his, his experience in his last days was not typical of even men who did similar things in the war. I mean, it's, it's a very unique sort of downfall and not one that seems to have been chalked up to insanity even per se. I mean, or it, he was driven insane by what he was seeing, but that it wasn't, you know, that these visions were not a cause, you know, caused by an illness. No, it doesn't seem to be that. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I think it, it points to the fact that he <clears throat> he certainly wasn't insane during the war. He certainly wasn't insane when he was state representative or became wealthy managing the lumber mills and the yeah. and the and working out the deals with the uh, the railroad companies, etc. This this was a highly competent individual. And, and even towards the end, being ill, you know, um, it, it wasn't a matter that he had dementia and the dementia caused him to see these things. It was the, the tenor of the reports is, you know, that more so that he was very, that, that he was rational and then these things happened and that drove him insane. Yes. And <laughs> there's, it's eerie, of course, the, uh, the final reports are that he haunts the grounds. Yes. And, uh, and, and certainly with the reports, I mean, I, you can see why he would be restless. Yes, I, I think that there, and there is, although the, I would say the majority of hauntings are benign and, and, uh, and non-tragic, there, there are malevolent individuals who, there, there are, and and I who, and I do think, you know, those are the situations that end up being counted as, you know, inhuman, etc. For the most part. Uh, for um, the most part, yes, I tend to yeah. agree. And, and, if, and as as we've noted, you know, <clears throat> there's 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 plenty of people in this world who are willing to commit uh, atrocities against mm -hmm. others and do horrible things perhaps 
for in their minds understandable reasons perhaps not right and and simply the act of dying does not magically transform them into better people exactly and uh, and I, I find it interesting so many people that we come in contact with they they accept that that spirits remain that you have apparitions and ghosts and they interact but when you say that the person the personality of the person carries over at least in part that yes. becomes unsettling to them yes <clears throat> and uh, and to me to me it simply makes sense this might be a good place for us to to generally close mm -hmm. um but to me it, it simply makes sense the the person uh the person the person that we are in life is the person that we are in death to such a large degree we uh we our, our interaction with <clears throat> perhaps things like time and space shift right but our personality for everything that we can tell the personality of someone is the personality that is that remains and and maybe that's why it kind of freaks people out too because it, it, in a way it's confirmation that that we do continue that we continue um i think i think again coming back to the to the conversation there that some folks you know certain uh ancestral lines do have a uh a sensitivity that that or an awareness that this seems to come through uh, for those along those lines, a lot of this kind of discussion is very commonplace. It just feels normal. It mm -hmm. feels very everyday. It feels like, well, of course, it just that just makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, for folks who may not necessarily have that perspective uh, or that that uh, mm, ancestral lineage, they those types of things may seem very unnatural i i think i think that's a good assessment based on my experience with people and and it, it tends to be anybody's guess um <clears throat> who who experiences what and and for what reasons um there's and and i think that you know the the ancestral lines uh, that that I suspect, I don't know, but I think that it's the ancestral lines that uh, well before modernity would have been uh, the folks called to be uh, shamans, uh, medicine men, druids, uh, the, that that class of uh, liminal or threshold people mm -hmm. <clears throat> that, uh, you know, even that doesn't necessarily follow uh, very specific lines. It might skip a generation. It might veer off in one direction. It might, uh, you know, predominate in one sibling and not in another. That's that's very true. That's very true. So, and you know, it, it's not real clear cut all the time. No, no, it is not. And and it's it's much, you know, those those types of acknowledgments and and realities are much like uh, paranormal study itself. Why is one why is one person affected and another is not? You know, we don't know in many cases, we but we can we can document that it is, even while we cannot answer necessarily the whys. And maybe that's the answer with a haunted house. It just is. It simply is. And uh, in in so many cases it's it's really it's it's not a malevolent darkness it's not an apex predator it's not a demon it's people it's people it's people who lived before uh who for whatever reason uh share an attachment and perhaps it's the same attachment that you have to your home uh you the the listener um maybe you love your home you enjoy your home you want to be in your home and they may as well and that's okay yeah, and, and that's generally how I look at it. And I think that's, you know, you, we, we, again, we, we both had 
very uh, very benign, very non-malevolent experiences in our homes. Um, and I think that's, that's to me, and, and there may be people who think that I'm absolutely crazy of saying this, but these types of, uh, you know, contemplating these types of reality are for me actually very comforting. Me too, but then, but they always have been for me, so. It's, uh, uh, so, you know, <clears throat> if you, if you, if you uh, live in a haunted house, <clears throat> there's, there's a good chance you could, you could just step in and enjoy it. That's right. I and still want them to make cookies. Well, yeah, well, yeah, I, I'm still waiting on that too. <laughs> pick up, pick up a broom and clean something while, while, while you're here. <laughs> Uh, you're going to be moving things around. Start with a mop. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may be the best place to end tonight. And we thank everybody. And yes, we will be do. back next Wednesday. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for Dark Ozarks, for coming along with us on this journey. And thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Alex. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everybody.